Hello, everybody. Welcome to Desks and Dorks, your favorite board game design and creation podcast that, as always, is shaped by you. I'm Riley, the desk, and hypothetically I'm joined by Kyle in that this is a front and back episode, if you will, where I have a recording here and then Kyle's will come at the end of ours, uh, where we're talking a little bit about the OGL situation and the current chapter end. I'm not going to call it the ending of it uh, or the resolution, but the chapter end of the OGL 1737 debacle. Uh, And, you know, the rendition of 1.0a technically still being exactly as it was, and the new SRD stuff. But before I do that, I would like to go ahead and introduce the one, the only... Miles the Weasel. And also, not a weasel. Uh, Just Brenton. Yeah, from Let's Play Games and Hobbies, because as you guys know, I like looking at things on the business side of things, so I kind of wanted to talk with them a little bit about how this new OGL situation, the whole debacle, one, impacted business throughout it happening, and two, how they're feeling about the end of it. So uh, how are you guys feeling about this SRD OGL situation from start to finish, or start to chapter end? So I will, I will say, because I'm a little more boots on the ground here, um, for sales during it, you definitely saw a lot of people uh, ready to jump ship. Yep. We saw a fair amount of uh, drop in Wizards products. and Just D&D Wizards or Wizards in general? Uh, just D&D Wizards. It, it did not seem to affect the magic community at all, although there's a fair amount of overlap yep. and there was rumblings. But that being said, people aren't willing to give up their cardboard track for that. No, they're not. So... But we did see a huge spike in, I, I wish I could say, sales of uh, Pathfinder, but we just didn't have that much on hand. And then it was impossible to get any. So, But, man, people were jumping ship to Pathfinder like crazy, which, I mean, for me personally, and I know same with uh, the weasel <laughs> here, um, that also he felt good about that too because we we both cut our teeth on pathfinder first edition and so really like the world i tend to like it more than D &D personally just because i like a little little more crunch to my rpgs than than D &D provides but so that's mostly what i saw from, from what i saw also is the people who still stuck with wizards even outright said the only reason i i I'm going to stay with Wizards and, and D&D for now is because I have so much invested in it. You know, they don't want to have to rebuy mm-hmm. all those books and stuff again. And I think that is that is an unfortunate downside. But you can even tell the people who love it and have bought all those things were still angry about the whole situation. And they were willing. If it was, if it was like the same monetarily-wise, they would just go to something else. Yeah, it, it, from that, you know, being on a little bit on the publisher side, even though we don't do Dungeons & Dragons stuff, content currently, um, I will say from the consumer side, and you guys know me, I mean, every single time a new book comes out, I buy that that fancy cover, and sometimes I'll buy the normal cover. Yep. Like, I have every single fancy cover that's been out since Saltmarsh. So, and some, not too many of the older ones before that, but, like, I, I, I go heavy into it. So, yeah, this definitely, I think, was an eye-opener for a lot of consumers and making us actually pay attention to uh, the publishers which is an interesting concept on the consumer side i'm sure yeah definitely not something you typically see uh mostly people just are like hey game i like you know they don't think the cards against humanity guys piece of trash yeah he is but um you know they just are like that's a fun party game which uh, it's fine that's how you know consuming i mean it's ridiculous to ask everybody to do research before every product they buy you know, but this one was interesting how much people who normally don't pay attention really, you know, did the did the whole prairie dog thing and stood up and like, Whoa, what's yeah. going on? And especially with like, obviously this doesn't impact you guys in that regard, but D&D Beyond, you know, the servers being broken for a day and a half for the unsubscribe, like that unsubscribe day clearly worked. Yeah. Um, and it was not a bluff. And when it hits the bottom line, it shows. Um, so how are you guys feeling about the fact that now it's the same? You know, they have not changed it, which means... Because I know there were some grumblings about concern for Pathfinder. Mm-hmm. Because it's technically based on that. Yeah. Uh, even, I believe, 2nd Edition still uses parts of the OGL, correct? I believe. I know the 1st Edition did. I don't know about I know 1st edition. edition did. I don't... I'm, um, I'm not a... I definitely don't that. know the... Yeah. I know you're not a, even familiar with the 2nd Edition for that one. I know you know it, but you're not like... 
have yeah, even asked. Yeah, I, I haven't been able to play it very much at all. Um, but I know it's nice that at least there's those grumblings are solved for now. I mean, it's mm-hmm. still revocable, so it could change at any time. And yeah. the Creative Commons piece for the SRD, the System Reference Document, the fact that you can now publish stuff with that material under a Creative Commons license, nice because they can't revoke creative commons yeah but how are you guys thinking like for ordering product and just for product in general are you guys expecting to still get a lot of fifth edition or are you going to look more at different rpgs I mean, we've always tried to carry other stuff in here I, I, I would prefer if people would try the third party stuff some of my like personally i think some of the best experiences i've had is with dread which is just a small rpg and stuff but there's definitely a lot of great stuff out there and i've heard plenty of people it sounds like you know even though they've gone back and everything, nothing has changed, uh, people have just lost faith uh, mm-hmm. in it. And I think a lot of people are still going to be looking elsewhere, even though mm-hmm. it's the same. They can't trust Wizards anymore, it seems like. Yeah, I don't know how much that's going to affect new people, obviously, too. And I still don't see it. I don't see us stopping carrying no. as much stuff. I mean, not... It's, you, it's, you guys it's, didn't get a lot of third party fifth edition stuff anyway, other than battle maps, I guess. So yeah, we did a lot of battle maps. Like the ones I try to get, it, it, more of the generic stuff, like you know how to be a better DM or vague adventure hooks. You know things like that tended to do well for us rather than like we did some stuff from uh, Goodman Games. Who do, I really like their stuff. They make really fun little fifth edition modules, and they. Also did some of the uh, re-releases of some of like the classic adventures that were updated for fifth edition too. Uh, I, boy, I, the community just did not embrace that very well, which yeah. is disappointing because they were really fun and pretty inexpensive. You know, like a nice little one-shot module that you know had all the, your stats, your pic, you know, pictures and everything. It like nine ninety nine. It was pretty great, but people like their official stuff and the you know and the books are pretty you know i get it and they all are the same size yep exactly you know whereas that there's it is less so well, they're almost like a magazine style. yeah they're a little firmer cardstock but still yeah magazine. so it that part wasn't gonna affect us in general it would be more just about the whether effect. or not people were going to be buying that you know and, and i think uh if we do want to see a change, if people do want to move away from Wizards, it's going to fall to people like us that I know when all this happened, I had already had learned to play D&Ds scheduled and stuff, but maybe it would be useful as if we have campaigns to be like, hey, you like D&D? Well, we could, I, well, I can show you this other system and stuff. So it could be a, a push in the community to actually try other things and put it out mm-hmm. there, and maybe that's all it takes. But sometimes you do it. learn to play Starfinder and the only people who show up are the desk and <laughs> and sibling of and, the desk yes. and associates of the desk. Yes, <laughs> only desk related folks. And it but, was a fun game. Star, I mean, that was Starfinder was fun though. I love Starfinder. I would play that again. I, so would I most really, of my associates. I, I really liked Starfinder. Yeah, but yeah, I know. Uh, uh, the weasel um, played. <laughs> he did uh, learn to play uh, mutants and masterminds here and. Again, it's just it's it's hard to grab people's attention because I don't I think they are worried about how difficult they're going to be. Dungeons and Dragons has made it into the zeitgeist enough that people aren't as like nervous to jump into mm-hmm. it. But like, it's also it used to be the opposite of a status symbol, and now playing D and D. I mean, again, your all your show, how many TV shows, not just Stranger Things, but how many shows reference it and talk about it? Like, it's. Yeah, how many celebrities play it? Like it's it's a big thing now. Whereas you don't hear, you know, about Vin Diesel playing After the Rain as much as we would love that to happen. Yeah, you hear about it playing D and D. The market share is is insane. If you go to the average person and ask them, "Have you heard of D and D?" A majority of people in America have heard of that, regardless of if they play or not. You and do you do still get some satanic panic ones though. Yeah, yeah. like oh that's evil. That one was a surprise as a well, somebody, retailer here. <laughs> somebody clearly summoned someone with this whole OGL. Debate. Yes, yes. So clearly maybe the panic was justified. Yeah, turns, turns. <laughs> but even going to like Pathfinder, which is definitely the second biggest in the market, asking them, "Have you heard of Pathfinder?" The number of people percentage wise drops off insane. So, huge, mm-hmm. yeah. Huge. And then throw Savage Worlds, which yeah. I know it is one of the bigger systems. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. To Pathfinder is like nothing. Yeah. Yeah. 
So. Yeah, you start getting into any of these. I mean, fate and all that. It's and that's not getting into any of the like you know very specific ones like Mile, uh, the the weasel, had mentioned dread, you know, which is it's a phenomenal it's game. So great, you know, and it, it it does stink that it takes up so much oxygen in the room. You know, I that being said, I also really appreciate it because the it's it has brought role playing into the zeitgeist in an amazing way. Mm -hmm. Obviously that things like after the rain can exist directly because of it. And mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons why that whole OGL debacle was such a blow to everybody was it's just like, man, you you made this amazing thing that was doing this and yeah, I, I again my hope is like like Miles said that it's going to push some of those players off into some of the other stuff. I mean, they do both. Like, you I'm going to keep, you know, my oh, wife yeah, and her yeah. group loves playing D&D, &D, where we have a session actually after recording this. and Yeah, I'm, I'm running a session after we record this as well. We are recording it in the place where I'm going to play currently. Yeah, we are literally forced to stop at a specific tab, which so, is fun. So, yeah, it's it's definitely not going anywhere God. in a in a big way, but... I, I do hope to see a little more uh, diversification, I guess, in, in that, and, you know. I understand that you know, there was a push from Hasbro and stuff to, you know, make it, uh, make more money for Dungeons & Dragons. Yep. There's just... you got to over-monetize instead of under-monetize. And I, I understand they have to do that, but they should have found a different way because they should understand that this is something for, you know, somebody who doesn't have a lot of money, they can still join a group every week and play. You don't barely have any buy-in. It's just something to escape with friends. It, and It's insane to me, too, the, the amount. Again, as a retailer, we sell a lot of D&D, &D, like, swag stuff more than you know, the actual content right oh absolutely i mean one of our biggest sellers and it has been since day one has been uh now gale force 9 makes them and they are official D, D stuff so clearly wizards is getting some money from them uh but they they do spell book cards mm -hmm. and they do uh little token sets that are awesome for it that people really like and it's like my god wizards Make official class dice. Mm -hmm. People would gobble them up like greedy little piggies. Yeah, but and when they do release official dice, they release that 11 set that's just a terrible red with white lettering. Yeah, I mean, work with a good dice company and get something official like Beetle and... Boy, I never know how to Beetle and Grimm. Grimm? It's Grimm's... I always want to say Grimes for some reason. Like, I don't, I don't know. But uh, Beetle and Grimm, uh, they, they did some great class-specific die. And they had extras in there, but they were all different based... You know, like your your rogue's going to have extra D6s for your sneak dice. and Your wizards you, are going to have extra D6s for their wizard dice. and Yeah, yeah. Let me guess your paladin had extra D6s. It's a lot of extra D6s. <laughs> but I will say, like, barbarians had extra D12s because there's a lot... You know, yeah. You're going to be using a lot of great axe stuff. And I guess you might as well have extra D12s, you yeah. know. Why not? <laughs> and... Uh, but it's still like a neat idea that, and they came in like a nice tin with some really cool art that the tin can also double as, you know, a dice tray. My, my son uses the barbarian set and he keeps his miniature in there. You can, it's a little small for a pencil. I wish they'd made it big enough to fit a pencil in there, you know, cause then it would have been like a really convenient thing that can almost fit in your pocket, but stuff like that. Extra things. I, I I know they have started doing. Uh, I think a certain desk here may have bought a uh, retro lunchbox. I mean, a lunchbox with a thermos. Thermos in hey, it. I, I pre-ordered that before uh, the OGL debacle. Oh, I know you did. <laughs> but um, but like that stuff is cool. That's the stuff that people are willing to spend the money on. Yeah. They don't want to spend the money to play. They want to spend the money to buy miniatures. To buy dice, to buy cool stuff, you know. The, we sell a lot of uh, Dungeons and Dragons, like little stuffed animals, and uh, there's some like I like the Albear dice bags. Yeah, yeah, and uh, there's they have some uh, little vinyl figure like blind boxes coming at some point. I don't know. I pre-ordered them like a year and a half ago. It feels like, but. You know, they'll be here eventually, and I know people are going to go crazy mm -hmm. for them. 
there's how you make your money, wizards. Don't don't force just that buy phone brain. It's on fine. There, yeah. <laughs> don't really. Yeah, don't yeah, do that I to mean, phone brain. I, yeah, don't do that to phone brain. I love that. But you know, some seriously, you've got the Hasbro. You've got enough money to get a decent dice manufacturer to make some decent high quality dice that people go gaga for. Yeah. You know, we, we sell hundred dollar plus sets of dice here. People love the swag. It feels like Wizards, because we mentioned they had such a huge market share, felt that they were invincible and could do push something <laughs> through like this. It it reminds me I, I worked at the post office before this and um it there was a similar thing back in the seventies. It was pretty much the post office was the only option, and they were terrible of customer service because you couldn't go anywhere else. Mm-hmm. If you wanted to send something, you'd do it through the post office, and that was what saw the rise of UPS and FedEx were able to come in because there was uh, the, the, people didn't trust the post office. People wanted a different option, and that's the same thing was happening right now. Is with you know they thought well we're the only person here that doesn't matter, but there's plenty of other places that people can go to and play now. And I think they're they're seeing the ramifications of that. You heard it here first. Fifty years from now, they're finally going to start feeling that bankruptcy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like, I, I know if you go to Germany and you, you mention like, what do they play over there? I forget the title. It's not even popular over here at all. And D and D is just one of the small things oh, over yeah. there. So it's not like it's a worldwide thing. It, yeah, it is. It is strictly American. Well, Norwegian. Yeah. The oh Ooh. gosh, man, that, I had that Norwegian role playing book we've talked about before on the show, um, and I think there actually is a potentially the conversation that we had with uh, Dina about that on a very old episode. But yeah, like they don't play that the D&D. They play third-party RPGs mm-hmm. because that's the culture. Yep. And there's some great ones out there, not just um, After the Rain or Fear Within coming to Kickstarter very, very soon. Um, but yeah, so I appreciate you guys taking the time. It's always good to see, I think, a little bit of different mindsets from it because you see the consumer and you see the little mini publisher but seeing it from a retailer side and a personal side is always kind of neat yeah thank you for having us this was a a nice conversation thanks for thanks for joining guys the weasel brent Mm -hmm. um as always you know if you're interested in role-playing games and you want to branch out we do have the fear within there's a notify me link although depending on when you're uh when you're listening it might be a live link at then um to check out a little one-shot rpg based on our vessel system um, which is a way to kind of play with friends in a little bit of a unique system. So instead of playing as a party, you are either playing as an entity or you're playing as a child. And you and your, you're the entity and the child are paired, and you're playing in these groups of two, four, six, um, trying to solve a common goal with the children um, being not plagued, but maybe guided, maybe a little bit of goaded, by these <laughs> entities, uh, you know, maybe it's Petey and the Big Shark, um, and they're kind of impacting the world around you and making it not harder but different to try to overcome um, this greater issue. So, yeah, we'd love you to check that out. You can check out Let's Play Games and Hobbies on all of social medias. I think right Instagram is what uh, they're all at Let's Play Hanover. Uh, don't bother on Twitter. I haven't posted since 2019. No, you're not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah you can check us out there or our website is letsplayhanover.com all right and we appreciate that and with that being said we're going to transition over to kyle so kyle take it away and uh, i have not listened to kyle's as of us recording this so this is going to be phenomenal we're going to see how this goes so have fun with kyle guys and thank you bye hello everybody and welcome back to desks and dorks is your favorite board game design and creation podcast that as always is brought to you by you we bring you the best at need tabletop gaming um and this is Kyle doing a really quick solo episode because, oh my gosh, and also hitting everything in our recording studio as I'm doing that. But I wanted to get a quick episode out because today, Wizards of the Coast made uh, the craziest announcement they've made since the whole OGL debacle began. They are rolling everything back. They're saying, nope, we're going to go back to the original uh, OGL. We're going to allow players to continue to profit off of our game and... Uh, we're not going to be trying to take money or, or make any sort of monetary gain off of the work that others are doing. This is absolutely wild, and it's a massive, abrupt turnabout for a company that uh, previously had changed their stuff to the most draconian language possible uh, for a document, and in the process, threatened to kind of murder 
like so many different smaller businesses that were dependent on the OGL in order to make Dungeons and Dragons content. I wanted to get this out because I, like many of you, am, am starting to have some questions about this. Um, so I'm going to talk about what I think about it and whether or not I think this is legit or if it's even a good thing. So first things first, do I believe Wizards of the Coast? No, not a chance, not a shot. Um, this is something that we have learned. If you've ever studied American history, uh, it is that you cannot trust corporations with anything. Why? Uh, because corporations are like cockroaches, um, or like any other sort of mythical beast that has to be killed entirely in order to be fully trusted. And I don't think they've been beaten entirely. Dungeons and Dragons remains in Wizards of the Coast eyes, I believe, a under monetized property. They have said that themselves in their investor call. They said this is an under monetized, um, part of our games portfolio and as a result we we want to make it more of a thing we want to bring it into the fold we want to do um, additional ways of creating revenue from this particular game that is a problem right and, and there's a problem for a number of perfectly legitimate reasons um, now do I think that a company shouldn't be allowed to profit off of their IP absolutely not that's ridiculous I, I run an RPG company you have to make money in order to pay for things. That's how money and companies work. Like That's the society we live in, unfortunately. Whether you like that or not is irrelevant. It is how things work here. What I don't believe is that Wizards of the Coast has learned anything from this. Right? They are, one, desperate. Um, Wizards of the Coast has released their investors calls and the money that they are making. And Hasbro is tanking right now. Hasbro is taking on water. Every one of its consumer goods sectors is in the worst state that it has ever been. Um, the pandemic has crushed things. Shipping has made things insanely difficult. And it is clear that Wizards of the Coast is trying to do some of the heavy lifting to bail its parent company out of water uh, in the short term. We saw this happen with Magic the Gathering, with things like the 30th anniversary packs. We've seen WPN stores getting cut out of things, the end of organized play, the end of event coverage um, for Magic the Gathering. And that was all stuff made to cut costs. And then what we saw was an overflood of product in order to sort of maximize things and get everything to a place where they can make as much money as possible for as little effort as possible um, in terms of what they can get from Magic the Gathering. And now they want to turn their eye to do it in Dungeons and Dragons. The issue is that I think, A, they were able to succeed in Magic because the trading card game market is very different than the RPG market. It is already sort of, how do I put this? It is already set up to be over monetized. I think the fan base is more willing to accept a monetization channel. And again, when you can pay an artist a fraction of uh, the value that they generate in terms of being like, oh, we've already designed one card, right? We don't need to pay a game designer to redesign the same card over and over again. And we can pay an artist a fraction of what that one variant card will give us um, and then use that in order to actually generate a ton more money. It's a, it's a slam dunk steal. We just have to print it. Wizards essentially gets to print money on Magic the Gathering. What they didn't take into account was that the RPG market is, is, is substantially different. And the community has given them so much over the years that for them to sort of take it um, in the way that they did uh, was just a, it was a, it was a bad move uh, from, from the jump. It was a, it was a bad decision from the jump. Now, do I think things are going to change? Absolutely not. No. Uh, there are a couple things that make me believe that this is not a uh, act of contrition. This is an act of, stalling for time. So let's go over a couple of those now. Number one is Hasbro is still continuing to take on water. Wizards of the Coast is a valuable asset to Hasbro as a company. It is a valuable asset to Hasbro as a business. And as a result of that, I believe they are incentivized uh, to continue to try to use the assets and the IPs in Wizards of the Coast to help... Um, defray the costs of running their business and to help mitigate some of the crushing failures that they have had in the consumer toy market right now. Um, we saw this again when they were starting to sell off some of their IPs to companies like um, Renegade Games when they sold off the stuff for Diplomacy, for example, and they sold off the Avalon Hill catalog. With that being said, 
The other issue too is leadership, right? Hasbro's current CEO has already said that he's going to do stuff. And I believe it's the COO. I, I, I'm blanking on her name, um, but she's an ex-Microsoft executive. And she was one of the people that helped to herald in a lot of the work on loot boxes, which for those not in the know are the randomized digital only crates uh, that were used in a ton of different uh, online video games. And so essentially these were like trading card packs that you would use in a video game. Um, and they cost just a, a metric ton of money and they basically allowed players or forced players to buy for content that was already in the game, um, but would just continue to generate additional revenue for the company. So that leadership is still in place. That need is still in place. And last but certainly not least, there is a track record here, uh, not just with Wizards of the Coast, uh, but with other games companies in general. I want to roll things back to a conversation that I had about Hearthstone earlier this year. Some of you may know that I'm a legend ranked player in Hearthstone. Don't worry, I'm not a high legend ranked player. I've never gone to a big tournament. I just like having the little glowy gem next to my name. All that needs, all that you need to know. Just know that I know enough to know I know how not good I am at the game, but I'm better than the average player. One of the things that happened in Hearthstone recently was the announcement of a battle pass system very similar to Fortnite. One of the things that they did in this particular game was they said, you know what, we are going to make an announcement. And the announcement of the battle pass that they made was terrible. The battle pass that Blizzard announced for Hearthstone was awful. One of the worst things um, imaginable. It was it was atrocious. It was one. Of, it was terrible, and they rolled it back immediately. And then they said, "Hey, you know, we're listening to consumer feedback. We're listening to customer feedback, and we are changing what we are doing as a result of what you have said. You want from us. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Interesting. And actually, this is something that's happened a couple times in the last two or three years." With uh, major companies, particularly with game companies, they will make an announcement, either a horrible patch or a horrible release or some uh, draconian change to the thing that they're doing. They'll claim they're listening to consumer feedback and then they will do an about face. And what they will make is still predatory, but it is far less predatory than what they had originally intended. And so what they do is they get to do the thing that's going to make them a ton of money and what many of them were probably going to do anyway. And then they get to claim some credit for being like, see, we're not the bad guys. We're listening to you. Look at how we listen to feedback. Um, this is a common tactic now. And we know this because we've actually had a couple insiders leak information from some of those companies that did that. Um, it's been a, cr a crazy year in, in games simply because that has been an issue, an issue, right? There's that track record and that tactic. So... Do I think you should trust Wizards of the Coast in this announcement? Absolutely not. Um, do I think they're going to change tact? No, I think the need is still there. I think the track record is still there. I think the leadership is still there to make them want to monetize this game in predatory ways. Why else don't I think you should trust them? Because even if Wizards of the Coast is sincere at this moment, right? let's say that Wizards of the Coast is 100% okay and on board and they want to do this they say i'm going to do the thing i'm going to do this right i'm going to make this right we are going to change the way that we do things the way that we do business and we're going to do it for the community even if they do it now there is nothing stopping the company from doing it again later nothing there is nothing stopping them from using their considerable resources and their considerable time and their considerable expertise or the expertise that they can buy to essentially say, I don't want this anymore. We're going to change it. And if you are someone who has built a business, a lifestyle brand, a way of being around that company, it is all the more reason for you to either find content that you know is safe, to broaden your horizons, to include all RPGs, or to specialize in another RPG to find some way to keep your business alive. It is imperative, I think. And if I was somebody who had made D&D content in the past, it's part of the reason that I have stressed I didn't want to make D&D content was I didn't want to make other people's games, right? Part of the reason Desks and Dorks 
makes games that we design is, or that I design, I should say, right? That I design and that Riley produces is these are properties that we can control. And because they are properties we can control, they are things that are wholly owned by us. We can do with them what we'd like, right? And yes, it's, we lose a little bit of stuff in the short term, right? Our name is not nearly as recognizable as Dungeons and Dragons. It truthfully probably never will be. Um, I have, you know, I'm not, I'm not a crazy person. I, I know we're, 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 we have, we are on track to be successful and to do the kind of work that we'd like to do, but I don't think we are ever, ever going to reach that level of D&D. I would hope so. I'm dreaming for it. I'm shooting for it. I'm working towards that, but I don't think so. But part of the reason that we did the things that we did was it gave us the freedom to do what we needed to do with our intellectual property, with the stuff that we make. Right. That was part of the reason I was like, I don't want anyone else's games. I don't want d and I don't want to publish stuff from other designers. I want stuff that we have that is wholly ours. Right. And again, this is part of the reason I don't trust this. And I don't think, it, I th- again, I think if you are a designer, if you are a content creator, a cosplayer, a writer, an artist, I don't think I would trust it either. Find another way to base your brand try to build up your base, try to do something because frankly speaking, I don't know if you can trust this announcement. And if you can't trust this announcement, it's going to make it very, very difficult to build a business, build a brand, build a lifestyle around that. I think that's a problem. Not only do I think it's a problem, but let's talk for a second about the impact of what this huge OGL debacle has done. Um, some people are saying, yes, this is great. We can all go back to D&D. And I don't think it's that simple, unfortunately. Um, what Wizards of the Coast has done is the exact worst thing you can do in the corporate world. They have proven two things. One, they have proven that their product is not as reliable as they'd like. And what they have done is they have lit a fire under consumers and under competitors. Because before, there was no need to fight against Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro. There was none. And that was the genius nature of the original OGL. Uh, There's a phenomenal article written by the uh, former, one of the former uh, corporate admin team members over at Wizards of the Coast. He's the guy who helped draft the OGL um, after second edition and into the third edition. And it was one of the things that he said that he did in order to save Dungeons and Dragons. He said, this was the decision that we made because we knew we, we had to make it a more popular game. We had to give the community and the fan base tools to make this game something special. And it worked. And that ecosystem allowed Wizards of the Coast to thrive. Yes, they left money on the table. They left money on the table with every sale and every third party adventure, every third party book, every third party piece of art, every third party piece of content that was made for Dungeons and Dragons. Technically, lost wizard money, but it bought them goodwill from their consumer base who would continue to buy and buy and buy. And it bought them marketing. It bought them into the zeitgeist. We would not have a critical role. We would not have a dimension 20. We would not have a community episode written about Dungeons and Dragons if it hadn't been for the work of dedicated fans. That marketing, that word of mouth has allowed Dungeons and Dragons to become something more than just a game played by people um, in basements and in comic stores around the world. It has allowed it to become a phenomenon. Wizards of the Coast now has created its own competitors. I think even with the announcement that they are walking back the OGL, Pandora's box has been opened. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I don't mean that Dungeons and Dragons is going to die. I don't think it is. I think that's foolish. I think that's, that's just doom saying for the sake of doom saying, I don't think RPGs are going to die. And I've said as much in an earlier episode, but what I want to talk about is they have forced a bunch of people to reevaluate their opportunities, to reevaluate the threats to their business, to their hobby, to their livelihoods. And as a result, even if Wizards of the Coast were to attract those people back, there is always going to be the fear that this could change at any moment. And if it could change once, then it could change again. Um, 
the thing that I like to think about, right, is that how do I put this? What was the what was the one thing? There's a there was a car the story about the car manufacturer. I think it was Enzo Ferrari who got rejected um, by a company when he had a car design. He brought a car design to a different uh, car manufacturer and he said, I-, "I would like to make this car." At the time, he had only ever designed tractors and he had a, a relatively decent working relationship with a bunch of different companies. And they said, "You stick to tractors, farm boy. Let you know, leave the cars to us." And what they did was they shattered that working relationship with somebody who had a product to give, who was content with the relationship as it was, but who wanted to try something else. What Wizards has done is they have shattered a relationship with people who were content to give, who have time, talent, aptitude, and markets that they were tapping into, and they have now launched their own competitors. Now, will those competitors be as robust, as strong as Dungeons & Dragons? I don't know. I genuinely don't know, but they're there and they weren't there before. Pathfinder sales are through the roof. Cobalt Press announced Project Black Flag. Pathfinder and a consortium of other game designers and publishers have announced that they are working on another license-free RPG rule system that allows players to make content for free under an open source license, under the Creative Commons license. Wizards has made its own enemies. And the problem is, even if the majority of Dungeons & Dragons players return to the game, even if the majority of content creators return to making Dungeons & Dragons content, if Wizards loses 15% of the total player base, it will be the biggest loss of their market share ever. And they are the root cause of it. It's a little too early to see what the impact of the OGL is going to be moving forward. But my gut reaction as somebody that has worked with startups, who has worked in games, who has been a, we'll call him a folk uh, folk DM, because that's truly what I've been as somebody who makes and homebrew with rules. I don't really care about the new additions. I care about building and being a part of my role-playing game community. And as somebody who has seen, observed, and been a part of all of this, I can't help shake the feeling that Wizards of the Coast has gone on to do one of the strangest, most devastating things that it can do to its own IP, to its own market share, to its own game. My prediction, my prediction is that in two to three years, the landscape is going to look wildly different and there will be more competition and there will be more problems and there will be more people stepping away from Dungeons and Dragons because of this, regardless of whether or not Wizards of the Coast decides to keep this new kinder old OGL again I what an interesting time to be an RPG player what an interesting time to be a game fan uh that's it that's all I wanted to talk about just my thoughts initial impressions and all that jazz um if you like RPGs I'm I would be remiss if I don't you know shill for my own RPG uh Fear Within is on Kickstarter you should click the notify me link check it out if you like RPGs uh if you don't like RPGs I am shocked that you are still here Uh, because this is like a 20-minute long conversation that we're having. But in any case, even if you are still here, if you don't love RPGs and you have managed to stick it out for this entire time, hey, man, thanks so much for for sticking around. You guys have been fantastic. You guys have been awesome. Uh, I am Kyle Ott for Desks and Dorks, and I will see you all again soon. Have a great one.